gran pronunciación, la buena pronunciación y el instrumento al oído. La buena pronunciación, la buena pronunciación y el instrumento al oído. Hola y bienvenidos to the Washington State Latino Leadership Network's uh, presentation on 21st Century Latin American Cinema Showcase with Noemi Solorzano Thompson. Uh, my name is Tony Griego. I am co-chair of the Washington State Latino Leadership Network. And the Latino Leadership Network is one of our state's business resource groups, which is dedicated to uh, helping to recruit and retain a Latino state workforce so that the state can, as a whole, deliver uh, better services to our, our Latino residents and the residents of Washington state in general. Um, as we get started, there are a, a few ground rules and things to make you aware of. Um, the Latino Leadership Network has a set of community agreements um, that we will stay engaged, speak our truth, uh, no fixing, uh, we'll experience discomfort, take risks, listen for understanding, and expect and accept non-closure. So those are the, the principles that we operate from to create a, a, uh, an inclusive and inviting um, community and presentation. I also want to let you know uh, that uh, we are recording this event and that um, you are participation in this video conference equals consent to be recorded as required by law and if you don't want to be recorded um, but you choose to participate you can also please turn your camera off and uh, use the chat feature to interact with other participants uh, if for some reason none of that works for you um, 
You can also watch this. We typically post our, our webinars and, and meetings on our YouTube channel, so you can view it after the fact. Um, as I mentioned, um, we are a state business resource group for Latino state employees and allies. And um, if, if you hadn't heard, we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as part of that, there is a vaccine mandate for uh, state employees that uh, goes into effect October 16th. But in order to meet that mandate, you need to be fully vaccinated. And, and at this point, um, your only option for to be fully vaccinated if you haven't started the process already is to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And um, I wanted to share with the group uh, that there will be a, um, I'm looking to drop it in the chat right now, a, a vaccine clinic available at the uh, Natural Resources Building on the Capitol campus. I'm putting a link in the chat um, on September 30th. And there are still spots available. So uh, if you have any questions, an excellent site it is uh, the website Adios COVID, uh, which provides information on scheduling appointments and um, as well as questions around the vaccine itself. So this is a, an opportunity to uh, get a free uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccination. Um, the, the last day that you're gonna be able to do that and meet the October 16th deadline is if you're able to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine by uh, October 4th. So I, I just wanna share that with everybody because um, we wanna support our communities, keep everybody safe and healthy, as well as make sure that um, we're providing opportunities to get that vaccination. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I wanna share our, our, our speaker today is Noemi uh, Solerizano Thompson, and she has a DEI or diversity, equity and inclusion learning design and delivery professional with the State Department of Enterprise Resources. Uh, prior to state service, uh, she was a college faculty member and administrator for 17 years. Her teaching and published research, published research focused on the portrayal of gender identities and sexuality in Latin America and Iberian film, theater, popular culture, and performance. Noemi has a PhD in Latin American literatures and cultures and previously served as the chair of the National Association for Chicana, Chicana and Chicano Studies, NOX, um, and the Mujeres Activas en Letras y Cambio Social, or MOX, uh, academic professional organizations. Uh, she is a first generation American of immigrant parents from Mexico and Nicaragua, and she is the proud guardian of Sally, a rescue dog that enjoys running on the beach. Um, so does my dog, a uh, coincidence. Um, Noemi also loves to talk about movies, all of them from world cinema to art house to the Marvel uh, Comics universe. So uh, thank you for joining us, Noemi, and um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Tony. I would like to thank everybody at the LNN Network, the Latino Leadership Network, for inviting me to give this talk today with a special shout out to Tony, Monica, and Indira for uh, helping the preparation of this. I'm going to start with an anecdote. Uh, and if you know me, you know that I always talk about anecdotes. When I began my teaching career, I had a student who, you know, raised her hand and said, why is it every time, you know, this is the student speaking, that I take a class on Latin American or Iberian film studies, all the films are about LGBTQ plus communities? Um, and, you know, my answer, which will be my answer for everybody today, is two. One, that tells you a lot about your instructor because we choose the films that we want to focus on. But part two also, that while there is a history, a very long and painful history of homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, and other intolerances and violence and resistance of freedom for LGBTQ plus individuals, it is still a very important facet of Latin American life and culture. So several of the films that I will mention today will have that content because again, A, tells you about my expertise and B, it is an important facet. With that in mind, I also want to let you know that the films that are presented today were selected entirely by me. 
this is not a representative sample of every film of the best films of the most important films or of you know the best examples of filmmaking you know that's a conversation for another time and as i always pointed out beauty is in the eye of the beholder the films that i think are important are not necessarily the films other folks consider important. And although I've tried to be an expert on most Latin American film production, I also have not seen every single film in the history of Latin American cinema. I have tried, and I'm still trying. So if we have time at the end for you to ask questions, I invite you to tell us about other films that you recommend. And, you know, I'm not going to say if somebody asks me, why didn't you talk about this film? I mean, that's not useful. I was only able to bring a small selection of films. I made these decisions based on my experience and my own personal view. Again, this is not a class. This is not a representative sample. This is a showcase selected by me. Also, I want you to know that a lot of these films are not appropriate for general audiences and sensitive viewers. A lot of these films have very complex situations about violence, about sexuality, and about political issues in Latin America. If we want to talk in the Q&A about films that are apt for general audiences, we can certainly do that. But in my career, and this is why I asked uh, in my bio that it was emphasized, my work is on gender and sexuality on Latin American film. So again, I've selected these films. I invite you to, you know, join us in this seminar, but of course, this is not all the films in all the world. Next slide, please. This is a brief outline. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, 101 film studies, just so that we can have some common language. Then I'm going to go uh, through the countries that I chose. Again, I am not able to talk about every single country. I still feel terrible that I was unable to talk about other countries, but you know, you have to make choices. Then we'll do a short conclusion and then we'll have time for questions and answers. I also want to let you know that I, when I'm presenting, will not be looking at the chat. So if you have a question, save it to the end and then the other uh, people helping us out will read those questions, but you cannot communicate with me during this presentation in the chat because in order to be focused on the presentation, I have disabled the chat. Um, next slide. So a lot of film studies theory and film studies vocabulary comes from the French Academy. The French in many ways invented film and they also invented film studies. One of the most important concepts that we have in film studies is the idea of the author theory. And I apologize for any native French speakers. My French accent is terrible. And my father always reminds me of that because my father is of North African, Algerian, and French heritage. He is of a lot of heritages, but that's one of his heritages. And he's always saying, Noemi, your French is embarrassing, which it is. So <laughs> this is the concept. And also, could you have your mic muted if you're in the background? Thank you. Uh, this is the idea that in film studies, uh, we have the idea that the author of a film is the director. So this is true for art cinema. It is not true for every movie. If you are thinking, for example, of Sharknado, and that's one of my go-to examples because I love science fiction and horror films, it's not as important who the director of Sharknado was. That was a film produced by the science fiction channel. That's a different story. But when it comes to art cinema, the director is the person who authored the film. So we're going to be basing that as our concept Again, it's not always true, but it is how I'm going to be doing this presentation of the specific films that we have here. Next slide. Many of you are aware of how film is produced in the United States and to make a huge industry into an oversimplification, 
film in the United States is produced by private enterprise, entirely about making money. And this is why if a film flops, i.e. a film does not recuperate what it took to make it at the box office and then makes a profit, it's considered a failure. Is this good or bad? That's a different question. But in Latin America, historically, and even today, that is not how film is financed. Most films historically until the late 90s were financed by two different types of funding. One of them, direct funding from the government. So sort of the equivalent of the national, indictment, uh, national endowment for the arts, the equivalent for those Latin American countries, or two, cultural institutions that may be attached to governments or might be nonprofit institutions, but are still cultural institutions. So it has never been about making money. Private enterprise has come to Latin American cinema in the late 90s, early 2000s, but the vast majority of films are still financed by cultural institutions along with the government. Now, I'm sure you can see that that prevents from some stories being told. You add that the history of repressive governments in Latin American countries, and of course you have a recipe for some tensions. So some of the films that we're gonna talk about, uh, especially the ones that are political, are specifically important films because imagine that it is the National Endowment for the Arts that's financing in the United States, your film, and you want your film to be critical of government institutions. Well, you know, that's kind of a difficult dance. That is the dance that filmmakers in Latin America have always faced. Let's talk a little bit about what it means to produce, distribute, and screen a movie so that we can also understand how that works differently in Latin America. Your production is the people who pay to make the movie. And because they're paying and facilitating the movie making, they're involved right there. You know, there is a producer and that person is both responsible to the people paying for the movie as well as facilitating the making of the movie. A distributor is a company. Sometimes it's the same company. If you have a movie from Marvel Studios, it's both companies. Uh, in other places, it's two different companies. It's the people who ensure your film makes it to the movie theater for screening. Uh, of course, the pandemic has finally shown something that filmmakers have been, you know, fighting for years. The idea that is a film something that can only be experienced in a movie theater to make it a film versus a TV movie. Netflix, Amazon, etc. Other streaming giants have been for years trying to say a film is about the length of a work, not about the medium in which it is screened. And of course, there's still that discussion, but the pandemic, I know it's controversial, the pandemic has shown us that we can have films that are not necessarily released first in a movie theater. In Latin America, distribution for national films. So let's say we're in Mexico and you want to show your film in a Mexican movie theater. Your Mexican film is guaranteed to be shown in screens in Mexico by the government. If you own a movie theater in Mexico, in order to have your business license renewed, you guarantee that you will show X number of films for X number of weeks in X number of screens. And even if nobody, not even your abuelita comes, you will still show that film to an empty room for those weeks. And if you are a business owner, that is a guarantee of your business license. So national Latin American films have a guaranteed screening and distribution. In the United States, of course, it's all about private enterprise. And if a movie theater thinks that a specific movie is not going to make money, 
they don't show it past their original deal and things like that. So again, in Latin America, movies are not necessarily about making a profit, but about negotiating a bureaucratic uh, system that guarantees certain screenings, certain distribution, and certain funding. And I want you to imagine that because that's what filmmakers have to deal with. Next slide. Now we're starting, now we're getting. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, different countries in alphabetical origin. Uh, you know, I think of these films as, you know, my children. I love all the films. I love so many films, but you know, we have to make decisions. I'm gonna start with Argentina. So in the uh, early 2000s uh, in Argentina, we had a flourishment of Argentinian film. Argentinian film historically has always been one of the largest productions in Latin American cinema. And this actually coincided with uh, some economic issues that are also reflected in these films. And these two films that I have um, showing you here reflect two different types of Argentinian film. Uh, on the left, we have the Son of the Bride, which is a rom-com. And Latin American rom-coms are not as free-willing, if you will, as American rom-coms. You know, there's other issues about, you know, economic insecurity, et cetera, et cetera, that happen. Um, and then on the right, we have an Aura, which is a film about a hitman. So, you know, serious political film with criminals, more rom-com, but also a critique of contemporary economic issues in Latin America. I would like to point out that both films star Ricardo Darín, who is one of the most important Argentinian actors of his generation. Uh, also, I want to point out that Fabian Belinsky made the movie The Secret in Their Eyes, which won the Oscar for Best uh, Foreign Film a couple of years ago. And we're going to talk about another film by Fabian because he is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting filmmakers of his generation. Next slide. Argentina also uh, has a lot of regional films. As you may know, in the US, all films were set, if we think about urban films, are either set in LA or in New York City, occasionally Boston, Philadelphia. But, you know, we don't have a lot of films that are set in, you know, Boise, Idaho, or Spokane, Washington. But those exist. These two films are films by regional directors that are telling stories outside of Buenos Aires. I would estimate that 90% of Argentinian films are all about Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires is an important city, but we also, Argentina is a pretty big country. Uh, the film by Carlos Sorin is an anthology film. That means different stories happen in the film that is set in the south of Argentina, Tierra del Fuego and Patagonia. My spouse and I love watching these films because you get to see an amazing landscape. Uh, and this film, while you know it has some serious situations, is more family friendly. Similarly with Pablo Trapero's film, Rolling Family, this is is a film about uh, an extended family that decide to go on a vacation together in an RV. I think of it in very similar terms as I do with Little Miss Sunshine, if some of you are familiar with that, in that, you know, the family, of course, is happy to see each other. But after a couple of days traveling in small circumstances, you know, all those tensions start bubbling up. Next slide. Uh, I wanted to bring these two other films to everybody's attention. On the left, we have The Headless Woman by Lucrecia Martel. Lucrecia Martel is one of the most important female directors in Latin American history. Just like in the United States, there's lack of representation in Latin American filmmaking, and that has to do with, of course, race, ethnicity, but also gender. I tried to include as many important female directors as I could, but sadly, women directors do not get 
the same access as male directors in Latin America, just like in the United States. Lucrecia Martel is a woman from the middle class. All her films are about some of the contradictions of the Argentinian middle class, particularly their history of collaboration with the dictatorship and also their ability to look away from some social problems going on in Argentina. So this movie is about a woman who uh, thinks she might have had a hit and run. It's not clear if this happened or not, but it's really about a critique of the middle class and their collaboration with state oppression. On the right, this is a film that I have not actually seen myself, but I'm bringing it up because it is being played in the United States right now. The film is Athor and it's by Andreas Fontana, a young, very young director, and it's about the dictatorship. Because again, in Latin American cinema, we always go back to these very important historical moments. So if the film is playing close to where you live, I encourage you to research the film and think about seeing it in the movie theater, if you feel safe, of course. Next slide. This is the film that I wanted to feature. The film is Nine Queens. This film was remade in the US. Do not watch the remake. Uh, overall, I think remakes sometimes are not good ideas. There's some that are okay, but in this case, a lot of the films that I'm gonna discuss today that have been remade into American films, I do not recommend watching the remakes. So Nine Queens is, I would say, close to a PG-13 type of film. It's a film about two con artists planning a heist. And if you're familiar with the heist genre of films, such as Ocean's Eleven, you know that there's a lot of plot twists, a lot of betrayals, a lot of backhanded things that happen, and you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you know that probably the criminals are going to get away with it, but you don't know how, you don't know if there's betrayals, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fun film, yes, about people who are criminals, but it is a fun film uh, about that. And like with all Latin American films, there's also in the background a consideration about what's going on historically during that time in the Argentinian economy. Next film. Now we go to Brazil. Brazil is the place in Latin America with the most uh, prolific media production. Brazil is, of course, one of the largest countries in the world, but it also has some of the largest film production, television production, and media production. So, you know, if you work on Latin American studies, you have to engage with Brazil. Uh, I'm going to first talk about three important directors. Walter Sales, Babenko, and Barreto. These films are from the 90s, but these three directors have a long history of making films. So first we have to acknowledge some of the very important filmmakers. Some of you might, not, might know Walter Sales' work from the Motorcycle Diaries. I prefer his film Central Station. But of course, if you watch this film, bring your tissue box because I cry during the entire film. The next film by Babenko, films by Babenko are not for people who cannot watch violence. All of his films are about violence. Carandiru is about the real life story of a doctor who specialized on HIV treatment in Brazilian prisons. And during his work, he was also an advocate for LGBTQ plus prisoners, who, of course, are not the only people who suffer from HIV. Just we don't, wanted to make sure that we all knew that. In this film is about a prison riot that happened at Carandiru prison, and that was very forcefully put down by the state. This is not a happy film. This is a film that's very accurate about the human rights violations that happened during this moment, combined with homophobia and transphobia. It is still one of the most important films, uh, particularly that intersectionality about prisoner rights, human rights, HIV, 
LGBTQ plus populations. The next film, Bruno Barreto, is also one of the most important filmmakers in uh, Brazil. This is a film about a historical event that happened during the dictatorship in Brazil when a group of anti-government commandos kidnapped the United States ambassador. Uh, true story. Uh, this film is an excellent historical film, but again, this is a very difficult time of political repression, so a lot of violence is watched in the movie. Next slide. Here we have uh, three other films, uh, including the film that I'm going to feature from younger directors. First, I'm going to talk about Madame Sata by Karim Anous. Madame Sata is the true story of a historical individual who lived in the early 1900s. If this person lived today, I do not know how they would have identified. Uh, this person was part of the LGBTQ plus community. This person had relationships with people of different genders. And this person was assigned male at birth, but also presented themselves in uh, their performance art at, with a female identity. Again, I... I'm hesitant to use any contemporary language to talk about this person's identity because that language did not exist then. But it's a very beautiful film. And of course, this person lived in the early 1900s. So they encountered a lot of violence against their identity, both gender and sexuality. The film Lower City by Sergio Machado talks about a threesome two men and a woman that are romantically involved and in all the complications that that arises. Finally, the film that I'm going to highlight, which is a PG-13 film, is one of my personal films, The Year My Parents Went On Vacation by Brazilian director Cal Hamburger. And I know his First name and last name sounds kind of funny when you pronounce it in English. This film is also set during the dictatorship. The main character is a small boy in 1970 Brazil. And as all small children, he is unaware of the reality of his country. His only goal in 1970 is to watch his favorite team, the Brazilian soccer team, win the World Cup in 1970. And this is not a spoiler. They won the World Cup in 1970. So that's, you know, his desire. However, unbeknownst to him, his parents are activists against the government and are being hunted by the government for their political activism against the dictatorship. So in order to protect him, his parents leave him with his grandfather, his paternal grandfather in Sao Paulo. And his grandfather is a Polish Jewish immigrant, Ashkenazi Jews immigrants, and most of the community that that grandpa lives in are Holocaust survivors. So uh, while it is PG-13, we have Holocaust survivors, we have repression, and it's all told from the perspective of a young boy who finally understands some of the reality that he lives in. Excellent film, uh, but, you know, tough, tough situation. Next slide. For the Caribbean, I'm only going to talk about a couple of films from Cuba and a couple of films from Jamaica. So let's start first with Cuba. So Cuban uh, filmmaking has always 100% been financed by the state, uh, including collaborations such as Seven Days in Havana, which is a collaboration of Cuban uh, funding from the state, along with French funding, also from the state, and Spanish funding, some of it more private. This is an anthology film, meaning it's a film by, in this case, by seven different directors who each tell a story about Havana. It's an interesting film. It also has uh, LGBTQ plus characters, and it shows some of the struggles they have being LGBTQ plus in Cuba. Um, you might recognize some of the names of some of the directors, such as Benicio del Toro. Uh, the, the person in this group who is Cuban is Juan Carlos Tabio, 
the other directors are from different countries, uh, but the movie was made in Cuba and I highly recommend. The second film, which is our featured film, is one of my personal films. You may have, you may remember I talked about my love of science fiction and horror. Well, this is a zombie apocalypse movie. You know, this is not a genre that only exists in Europe and the US. The title is already a play on Shaun of the Dead by Edgar Wright, a very important zombie apocalypse film. In this case, we have Juan of the Dead. And in the film, Juan is sort of under unemployed and he's kind of a slacker i mean in the cuban context he's a slacker and when the zombie apocalypse comes he finally sees a good opportunity to make money and his business model is if your abuelita or your tia or some loved one in your family becomes a zombie you yourself would not feel comfortable eliminating them you know, from the zombie world, because, you know, you're conflicted, they're your family member. So he will come and help you dispose of your zombie relatives. Uh, while this movie is kind of silly, it also does have some very interesting uh, commentary around Cuban uh, capitalism or lack of capitalism, uh, Cuban government, and it also has a transgender character who faces a lot of transphobia because Cuba is not a very friendly place to LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, but if you're into zombie films, I think you would like this film. Next slide. Whenever I teach classes in Latin American studies, people always ask me, but Noemi, why do we talk about Jamaica? They speak English in Jamaica. And I also point out that while in the Caribbean, we like to sometimes say the British Caribbean, the Spanish Caribbean, the French Caribbean. For people who live in the Caribbean, the island next door and you have a lot more communication than you might necessarily with the mainland. So Jamaica is one of the most important places where culture is produced. Jamaican music is one of the most influential musical genres. I mean, we all know reggae and we all know reggaeton. And if you don't know reggaeton, we'll talk later. But uh, Jamaican music, Jamaican culture, Jamaican uh, outfits, et cetera, et cetera, are super important. So we can never really ignore Jamaican filmmaking from Latin American filmmaker. I would like to highlight these two films, Dance Hall Queen, which is a woman who is a single mother trying to get ahead by becoming uh, a dance hall queen, winning a uh, dance competition. But it is not a light film because there's a lot of difficult situations, including domestic and sexual abuse that happen in this film. This is not, you know, strictly dancing. This is a woman who's trying to get out of poverty through winning a dance competition. And the effects of violence and poverty are very much seen in the film. The other film, Third World Cop, is actually more of a comedy. There is a lot of violence, but there is, uh, but it is more of a comedy. Uh, this film is in light with things, uh, with other films like the Bad Boys uh, films in the United States. In this case, it's about a cop who goes back to his hometown and, of course, he single-handedly ends drug dealing. You know, and we have a lot of those films in the United States. Um, you know, it's impossible. That's not how reality works. But it is an action film. And in some ways, this main character is also as suave as James Bond. And I bring up James Bond because in 1950, the first James Bond movie, Dr. No, was made in Jamaica. And because the British filmmakers hired a lot of local people in Jamaica to make this film, this is the entryway of a lot of actors, directors, production assistants. This is their first experience was working on a James Bond film, and that launched Jamaican filmmaking. Uh, you know, Third World Cop is fun, you know, has a happy ending, but it does have a lot of violence. Next. I decided to talk about three films from Chile that are all about the dictatorship. 
You might be wondering why. Well, when I was growing up in South Florida, my mother is Mexican. My father is from Nicaragua. But my mother's best friend when I was a child in South Florida was a Chilean woman who was a survivor from having been tortured by the dictatorship in Chile. So when I think about Chile, I can never not forget. I mean, I cannot forget my family friend who I thought of as my tia. That means aunt. So, you know, she was in my aunt by blood, but she was, uh, you know, she earned that that love for me and her experience. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional, but her experience has always structured my understanding of Chile and culture. The first film, Machuca, is about a little boy growing up during the dictatorship. The second film, Nostalgia for the Light is actually a documentary, but it's by Patricio Guzman, who is one of the most important filmmakers of Chile, who had to be exiled during the dictatorship because of his political activism. Finally, the other film by Pablo Larraín, very important film, the film No, with uh, Mexican actor Gael Garcia Bernal, was about the referendum to end the dictatorship. So at the end of the dictatorship in Chile, the government actually had, it's called a plebiscite uh, in Espanol, it's plebiscito. We would probably call it more of a referendum in the United States. For the first time in many, many years, people were given the right to vote and it was a yes or no answer. The yes answer is yes, we want the dictatorship to continue. And no, we want the dictatorship to end. Now, people were afraid uh, to vote because, you know, you have had one of the most horrible, repressive dictatorships. And there's no guarantee that the government was not going to record what you voted for. So, you know, did you really have the freedom to vote? No. So it's about that moment uh, and what happened. Next slide. And now we get to Mexico. Uh, most of my work has been done on Me Mexican, Mexican-American, Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx work. So uh, this is one of the areas that I know a lot about. I'll start with these two films because these two films uh, are so important that now are part of the Criterion edition. Uh, that's a very uh, well-known uh, distributor of DVDs of art house films. Amores Perros and Y Tu Mama Tambien. These films uh, are very well known through their Spanish titles. So this is how we talk about these films. We don't have, in some cases, you might have an English title, but these films are known by their Spanish titles. Amores Perros by Alejandro González Iñarito is the first film made in Mexico entirely by private funding that was not a flop. And of course, many of you know, Gonzalez Iñarrito has now made a lot of films in the United States. Similarly, Cuaron with Y Tu Mama Tambien. Uh, neither one of these films are appropriate. Uh, you know, I think uh, Y Tu Mama Tambien is NC-17. Amores Perros is rated R. They're not appropriate for general audiences. But uh, these two directors with these first films in Mexico now have international careers. Uh, next slide. Next, of course, many of you might be familiar with the work of Guillermo del Toro. I wanted to emphasize this 2001 film that he made in Spain. It's a Mexican and Spanish co-production. Uh, the film, The Devil's Backbone, is a ghost story. When he wrote the screenplay, it was going to be set during the Mexican Revolution. But when funding became available uh, and easier to make it in Spain, he changed it to the Spanish Civil War. If you like horror, I highly recommend watching The Devil's Backbone. Uh, the first uh, poster is the original poster. The other poster is the Criterion Edition poster of a trilogy of Guillermo del Toro films, which starts with Cronos, which is a vampire uh, film set in Mexico City. 
then the devil's backbone, and finally, Pan's Labyrinth, which I'm sure many of you have heard. These three films are thematically related in that they're all horror films, but they're not like part one, two, or three, but Criterion has made them available as a set. And then, of course, we have Carlos Carrera's very important film, The Crime of Padre Amaro, based on a Portuguese novel, but adapted to the 20th century, which is a criticism of the Catholic Church. So, you know, this film is extremely critical of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church is still very upset about it. So, warning for you. Next slide. So these are uh, more uh, younger filmmakers. Uh, we have Silent Night by Carlos Regadas. Carlos Regadas is a very uh, interesting art film director. And what I like about Silent Night is it's set in a Mennonite community in the north of Mexico. Mennonites are uh, similar to the Amish. They're different, but think about that. You know, similarly, they also speak uh, German and old dialects that are based on German. And we have a very large Mennonite community in northern Mexico. So it's about that community. Ms. Bala by Gerardo Naranjo was also remade recently in the U.S. Again, I do not recommend the remake. Uh, it's an excellent film about a young woman who has very few economic opportunities. So she is forced into being a smuggler of money and drugs on the U.S.-Mexico border. The last film, finally a film that is more PG-13, is the beautiful film by Patricia Riggins. Patricia Riggins is a female director from Guadalajara, which is where my mommy's from. Uh, this is a beautiful movie, but let me just tell you a little bit more about it. This film was made in 2007, but talks about a very, very contemporary issue. The film starts Kate del Castillo as a Mexican undocumented immigrant who comes to the United States to uh, become a domestic worker in Los Angeles. And as many folks who come from Latin America, leaves her family behind. She has a small son. Uh, the son no longer has a father. So she leaves her son in care of her mother, Abuelita. In the movie, Abuelita passes away, uh, and the child becomes an unaccompanied minor who illegally crosses the border to be reunited with his mother. Uh, this film was made before some of the more recent changes to border policy, but it does show some of the realities. However, it has a happy ending, and it has what I consider to be some very fantastical events that I wish were true, but in reality, unaccompanied manor, minors crossing the border to be reunited with family uh, often do not have a happy ending. My favorite scene in the movie is where this young man and other uh, migrants are looking for a ride once they're past the border in Texas. And, uh, you know, a, pick, uh, a van stops and it's a van literally driven by Mexican super band Los Tigres del Norte, which, you know, for me, it's like, ah, and they give the little boy a ride. I mean, that's not real, but great scene. And of course, Los Tigres del Norte uh, created a uh, soundtrack for this movie. Highly recommend this movie. It's a tearjerker, but it does have a happy ending, which many of the other films sadly do not. Next slide. We're wrapping up already. Uh, from Venezuela, I bring three films. The first one, Sequestro Express, which is about a uh, criminal enterprises and hostages in Venezuela. The second film was recommended by Indira, and I have personally not seen this film, sadly, but she always talks to me about it. And because it's a film about an LGBTQ plus parent, I wanted to bring it to attention. And the film that I'm going to highlight and feature is Pelo Malo, which is about a, a uh, mixed race, uh, Afro-Latino, Afro-Venezuelan boy, and how he experiences, even though he is a young boy, racism around his African features. Uh, beautiful film, 
sad film, but you know, about reality of racism in Latin America for folks of African descent. Next slide. Because we are running for time, uh, let's actually go to uh, the next slide. Perfect. So now we have time for Q&A. Uh, and the way that we worked on it, because I still could not see the chat, is that uh, Indira or Tony are going to be asking some of the questions that you may post in the chat. And I'll do my best to answer them. So Noemi, this is uh, this is Tony. Right now, we don't have any questions in the chat. So if you don't mind, oh. I'll get us started with one. Um, I should have given you notice yesterday. Uh, no worries. Uh, so, well, I guess the, the big question has been, will we get a list of movies yes. emailed to us? And yes, yes. we have them. Yes. Um, uh, you registered for this program and we have your email, you will get a PDF with all these titles. Okay. And then Samantha uh, has asked, is there a, a streaming service that shows a lot of these films or, or do you recommend any services that can offer them? So Amazon Prime rents some of these movies. Sometimes some of these movies are on Netflix, on Amazon Prime, on HBO Max, but there is no service I would personally recommend to watch Latin American films. Unfortunately, it'll be a labor of love of you uh, finding individual films, watching it because they only stay there for a couple of weeks. But many of these films can be rented individually through Amazon. And my, my trick is to, um, oh, somebody recommended Canopy. Okay. Yes, Which Canopy has some of these. Uh, Canopy has bad hair, but uh, a lot of the other films, unfortunately, are not in Canopy. Yeah, and I I, I, I Google movies, and then, because now their, their search will list what services are available, and if you can rent it or stream it, so that's my trick. And Ryan, the Criterion channel does exist, but only three of the movies that I've shown are part of Criterion, unfortunately. Um, Victor asks if you can recall a film that was influential in a political sense, um, for something me? that oh, well, oh, oh, oh. for a community. So something that stimulated change in in a country or a community. So when I was writing my dissertation, I wanted to say that specific portrayals of LGBTQ identities in film had, you know, created an opening for LGBTQ plus folks in society. And my dissertation advisor said, films do not change people's lives. So that's the official disclaimer. Uh, I'm going to say this is Noemi and only Noemi speaking, uh, that some films have encouraged some changes. I would say La Historia Oficial from Argentina, the official story was very important in bringing uh, attention to the history of the dictatorship in Argentina. Uh, there's a Mexican movie named Rojo Amanecer, Red Dawn, about the what happened in 1968 that was in Mexico that was important to change, uh, you know, some of the ideas around that. Uh, I would also say Pichote by Hector Bamenco was an important film that created a lot more awareness about the situation of street children in Brazil. I think a lot of these films have had more have brought awareness to the situations that they're portraying. But, you know, to quote my dissertation advisor, we cannot decisively prove that a film will change behavior. Okay, so I'm going to start this question. First off, the, the, the beginning is Tony editorializing because we're all going to, you know, to meet the, the state vaccine mandate, we're going to, first aid employees, we're going to get our jab. So it'll be safe to go to film festivals. Um, so the question is, are there Latin film or Latina uh, film festivals in Washington, um, similar to like, you know, how, how there's maybe black film festivals, that sort of thing. Uh, there is one that happens a couple uh, X number of years. It hasn't happened recently in Portland. Uh, there is a Latino film festival in Portland. I do not know if there's one in Seattle. Uh, 
most of my uh, experience in Washington has been living in the eastern side, and I didn't come to the western side until during the pandemic. So uh, I know that there are international film festivals in Seattle. I just do not know personally if there's one only dedicated on Latin American film, but there is one in Portland, uh, which is, you know, as close as we are to, you know, another area where that might happen. But I encourage yeah. everybody to do research on that. And yes, be safe. Oh, and then, um, yeah, it looks like Julia um, has, has shared a link to... Oh, thank uh, you. Yay! SIF. Um, and there's also the Seattle International Film Festival, mm -hmm. um, which I think many of these movies have been featured at at some point in the past. Um, so thank you, Julia, for, for sharing that. And she provided a link as well. Um, Ty says it's almost Halloween. Um, what is your recommendation for a good Halloween movie? Um, could be adult or kid friendly. I do not know any Halloween films that are kid friendly. I personally don't have children, <laughs> so sorry. Uh, but uh, I would say One of the Dead for sure, absolutely, one hundred percent. You should start with that, and if not, watch the trilogy of films by Del Toro, Cronos, The Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth. Yes. And they, they are creepy. Um, yes. And then uh, Julia also had a question. She said that, um, so three of the films shown um, that you shared from, from Chile are about or, or touch on the dictatorship. Um, is there a concern from the directors, actors of, of negative or, or backlash from those support the dictatorship? And if well, so, um, what are they and how do they protect themselves? Uh, so the dictatorship is over. Fortunately, gracias a Dios, the dictatorship is over. Uh, however, Patricio Guzman had to leave his native country uh, for many, many decades. He's not the only one uh, because if he had stayed, he would have been murdered. Uh, during the dictatorship, a lot of actors, directors, filmmakers, in most importantly, Victor Jarra. Victor Jarra was one of the most important Latin American musicians of his generation. He was murdered in public by the dictatorship. Uh, so yes, any film during the dictatorship that was critical of the dictatorship, people would have been murdered. Uh, now the dictatorship is over. Uh, as with many Latin American countries, no one has gone to jail for their crimes during the dictatorship. Part of the transition to democracy was to guarantee that people who committed war crimes during the dictatorship would not be uh, faced with any repercussions. Spain tried to arrest uh, the general, the dictator, Augusto Pinochet, but unfortunately he was let go. Now he's dead, uh, but nobody has paid for any of their crimes. Uh, you know, it, it's difficult, but, you know, there's a lot of anger for survivors because nobody paid for any of those crimes against humanity. Oh, but, yeah, yeah it, wow. it's tough. Yeah, thank uh, you, Julia. That was a great question. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, yeah, no, no worries. No worries. And yes, I highly recommend. And actually, we might see a change with the death of uh, Victor Jarra. Victor Jarra was uh, married to a woman from the UK, and she's been for years trying to bring justice by saying, somebody murdered my husband. It's time for people to pay for that. So I, I have a question myself. Um, so I, one of the podcasts I listen to is called Alt Dot Latino, and it's about uh, Latinx music or, mm -hmm. or different groups. Is there is there any sort of resource like that that you would recommend for people who want to learn more about Latin cinema? Uh, you know, I am unfortunately not familiar with podcasts. I know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't absorb information orally very well, so I read or watch. Uh, there are several documentaries about Latin American cinema that are found in Canopy uh, and in the Criterion Channel. So that's what I do. And of course, I read a lot of uh, Latin American cinema uh, books. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, um, unfortunately, I am not uh, able to give you information about podcasts. I'm sure they exist, <laughs> but unfortunately, I, I am ignorant of podcasts. Well, thank you. Um, so Laura has a question. Um, could, 
Do, could you explain or, or elaborate on, on why Latin American, why a Latin America country focus or, or cartel or crimes rather than other topics? Uh, I know that this is one of the main mm -hmm. issues in Mexico, but um, it's kind of, oh. it's very prevalent in the, the films we're talking about. So, you know, um, on the street that my mother was born, um, and my family lived, we know of five people who were murdered by the cartels. And find anybody from Latin America and they'll tell you that they personally know somebody who was murdered by a cartel. Uh, it's a huge problem. We all have been affected. As I said, my mom knows at least five people from the street that she was born from Guadalajara who were personally murdered by the cartels. So this is a huge phenomenon. In the United States, we don't have the same relationship to drug crimes. There are folks because of where you live and your ethnicity and economic situation where you experience more of that effect. In Latin America, very few people are insulated from that. The top elite, of course, are insulated from that, but the rest of the people in Latin America are affected in their everyday lives by this type of crime. And because these type of crimes are part of your everyday existence, of course, di directors are going to talk about it. Yeah, and, and I think it seems to me that one of the key differences between uh, Latin cinema and the, this subject versus American cinema is that it, there's a very much a human oh, focus on the humanized stories versus a, a, a um, stereotypes or um, you know being just being the uh, the, the nameless bad guys because uh, of Mexican cartels that sort of thing. Um, exactly, exactly. I do not watch American films about Latin American issues for the most part because those films are not. Uh, painting a positive or accurate or complete uh, image of Latin American issues. Yes. Um, you know, and I agree, absolutely. You know, I've gotten into shouting matches about Soderbergh's film Traffic many, many times and why that film is horrible. Uh, artistically, very well made, but that movie is horrible uh, because that's not what really happens. Uh, I'll stick to Ocean's Eleven for a bit, so. <laughs> Yes, um, yes, that's a better Soderbergh film, much better. Yes. So I, I, we, we're coming up on time, so we're going to have to wrap up. I want to say thank you again to Noemi. Uh, this has been, been really great. Thank you every, to everybody for your questions. Um, we'll be providing the list of um, movies once again after the meeting. Um, I want to say thank you from the Latino Leadership Network. Again, we, we are a business resource group meant to... Uh, to help recruit and retain Latino state employees. Uh, we have an event actually coming up as part of our um, Continuing Hispanic Heritage Month on uh, October 7th from noon to 1 p.m. And we're partnering with the Rainbow Alliance and Inclusion Network, which is uh, our, our partner uh, business resource group dedicated to uh, LGBTQ plus community. And we're gonna be exploring the intersection of race and gender with the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so there's Latino, Latina, Latine, and Latinx, you know, that whole kind of conversation. Uh, after that, we will also have our October 12th uh, general membership meeting at the regularly scheduled time. Um, thank you again so much, Noemi. This has been really a treat. Um, just personally, I, I found this very entertaining and, and very informative. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>